then, folks, welcome to episode three of Goldie Lockdown, the lockdown podcast with Ant Martin and Nathan, where we are looking real time at clips. It's called Goldie Lockdown because Martin pulled this Goldilocks clip out the bag and we've been chatting about it now for two episodes. We're going to chat about it some more in this episode because believe it or not, there's some stuff in it that we still haven't picked up on. Before we start though, I want to give a massive shout out to the people that commented on the last couple of videos. Uh, Mark Watson, uh, he's a sound lad, Mark Watson by the way, Nathan Wood, Tahir Sid Khan, Rob Lindsay, Paul Min, Thanks very much for your comments. We've looked at all of them. They are all very interesting comments and no doubt we are going to be talking about what you said in this video right now. Nath, go mate, because it's it's clip time. Yeah, no, I think um, there was some suggestion of, of something may have happened with the goalkeeper um, when we were looking at it previously and I noticed it out of the corner of my eye and I've had a I've had a chance to have a, a little look at it and, and I formed my own opinion, which uh, I think we're going to look at it in a minute. So when we have a look at it, um, I'll tell you what I think. But I think it is interesting, you know, the level of concentration that you've got when you go through the through the whole clip as, as we did to look at, obviously, the initial incident to then look at the the, 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 the conversation between uh, Kevin, uh, Adam, the referee and the assistant to talk about... Uh, when he's when he's communicating with the players after he's had that conversation, we've looked at those both those things in the previous part of the conversation, um, the previous two parts of this conversation, and I think the the next little thing that we were looking at was this this little incident here, and I think it's amazing. I've gone back and had to have a look at it after we've we've done it and all the concentration that goes on, but uh, but yeah, no, definitely had a look at it, definitely got an opinion on it, and I think it might surprise you what my opinion is. Well, before we pass over to Tol, you actually said on the other on the other episode yesterday or the day before us about, oh, yeah, the goalkeeper kicked the ball at Adam, didn't you? And I said, oh, did he? Did he? And we jumped on it. Oh, the interesting part of that is this is a three-minute clip of a 90-odd minute game. And if you've got these little bits going on, as you said, mate, Nate, about concentration levels, your heart's going to be beating 10 to the dozen here as a referee, yeah. isn't it? You're going to be all over. You're thinking, oh, my bleeding gods. I've got players running over to me, Lino. I've got a lad down there who don't know where he's got his nose broke, his jaw broke. The ball's in the back of the bleeding net. You're bound to be able to lose concentration yeah. a bit. So what, what's your take, so on like those? So how do you keep your concentration levels during the game? Do you, do you, is there any little method you use or how do you pitch it? I don't know. It just, it, it's something I think that has become instinctual. Like um, just having to be switched on. I find myself sometimes I, I will switch off during a game, but in moments of uh, like, like these ceremonial set pieces is an excellent opportunity as a referee, as a match official to just re-engage yourself before something big is about to happen. So I'll have a big scan of what's going on, kind of settle myself and then just prepare. But I find in, if there's a long period of open play where not a lot of stuff happens, which is, you know, down at grassroots, there can be periods like that. You do find yourself just going through the motions, well, speaking personally here, of just chugging around the pitch, waiting for something to happen instead of, um, because it's nigh on impossible for 90 minutes plus to be constantly switched on for all that time. So I find that those big key moments in the match, uh, the ones where players stopped uh, and, and you have to kind of get ceremonial with, they're ideal moments to to kind of re-engage into the game. Mm -hmm. Recalibrate your performance. Absolutely. What, what I like to talk about with the lads I coach and girls we coach is always expect a fork in the road in a game. Always, it could be anything. Or if, and if it hasn't come in the last five minutes, don't think, oh God, I've got five minutes to go and switch off. Think it's coming now. It's coming now. Last 10, it's coming, it's coming. And it keeps you on your toes. And it, and if you have a game without a fork in the road where something's happened, happy days, but at least you were prepared for it. If you're always waiting for it to come and, you know, just be on your toes a little bit because when the fork and roll comes, it's going to go two ways. It's going to go tits up and you're going to have something like this on your plate or it's going to carry on going. Happy days, you've dealt with it properly and you move on to the next one. So always expect something like this to happen. Mm. How many times do we see offences where it's kicked off where you think, oh, I don't even know what went on there. 
Yeah. But how many incidents do you see, like, just the ball's going to be going out for a throw-in? You know, the most they're going to get out of it is a throw-in. And someone wants to put him in Rose's head or a little shove and he goes into the barriers or in the corner flags. They're the times to switch on, not to switch off. So why you wanted to talk about that is because this is a good example of switching off, Adam, even though I keep saying I can't, I can't praise this lad how much I've already talked to him for the last couple of episodes. He's made up for discussing it, brought him back as little wants to be refereeing, but obviously because of, because of his Achilles, he can't. But he does refereeing for leisure leagues as well, so he's still out there blowing a whistle. But this is a good example of switching off. So let's press play on this and just see what the goalkeeper does and if you got a problem with that. Yeah, so the thing is, I think it's really, really interesting because we look at this constantly. Well, I say constantly. We've had a quick look. I genuinely don't feel as malice in it. I really don't. Um, that's my honest opinion. You know, I, obviously, I, I said I'll tell you what I think. I've looked at it. I don't, I don't think there's any malice in it. I genuinely think that you've got a goalkeeper there who's a bit bemused because obviously we've seen him in the. You know, we looked at it in the previous two episodes. We've seen it uh, where he's he he, well, he was running. He was running mad. He was the one who was running mad more than anybody. The goalkeeper. He was running right. He was running left. He was frantic, and I think that he's somebody who obviously is um, kind of of an opinion of I don't really know what's going on anymore. My view is that he was he was not clear on what the restart of play was because um, I think he was aware at that stage that the goal was either, he either felt, had a feeling that the goal was going to be disallowed or he'd already been told or I'm not entirely sure what exactly it was. But for me, it looked as if he was giving the ball back to the referee because he didn't know what the restart of play was going to be. And that, that's my honest opinion, having had a look at it. All right, mate, before we hand over the toe, when Adam was talking to Kev the Lino and then he pulls away, Weymouth, the team in Claret and Blue, and in the other half, every player's in the other half. They obviously think it's a goal. Yeah. They, oh, they've set up for a restart yeah. of, a, of play as a kickoff after the goal. So clearly, they all, no, it could be a ploy. They could think, right, let's get back to my professional on referee, so, you know, make him think it's a goal. So, straight away, he obviously hasn't managed the situation that way either, has he, to say what's going on. Now, the goalkeeper here, when we talk about priorities, about um, what's your priority? Remember, we did it with the uh, star position, we, we do it with dead balls. What are your priorities? When he's left that guy and he knows he's not injured, he's going off for whatever treatment he's going to get. What do you think should be your priority next, Ant? Well, heading over to the assistant. Um, but I, I, again, I, I'm, it's still not clear whether the assistant gave a covert buzz or an overt flag. If the if the assistant stood up there with the flag, everyone will know that not no decision has been made yet because there will be a consultation there. Yeah. Okay, go, I back think it's go back a bit. Go back a bit. You've decided to go over to your lino. Mm. Do you not think the ball, where the ball is, who's got the ball, is a priority before you do that? Well, uh, the ball's in the back of the net, so... Well, it's not, because it's going to be in the goalie's hand, isn't it? Well, how, how does it get to the goalie's hands to throw, to throw at Adam? Well, he picks it out of the back of the net. Yeah, so, so do you not think your priority is a match official to say... Where is the ball? Control the ball. Be aware of the ball. Or is that just mm, not in your mindset? That's not in my mindset. Why? Uh, because I think it's irrelevant for whatever decision I'm about to make. Well, it's not irrelevant at the moment because five seconds later, you've got a problem because it's landed at your feet. And you've got no idea whether he's done that in a decentful manner or not. And then as Adam walks away, who's the only people in his vision? At the moment, he looks at the goalkeeper, doesn't do anything. He's clocked the goalkeeper, he's going off the ball. And then the sole focus is on Kev. Going back to the Goldilocks zone bit, what could he do better to prevent the ball coming towards him? And maybe going back to what we talk about, having your back to the technical areas, 
How does that come into play here? Well, his again, like the movement coming into the box, um, the movement going over to the assistant could have been a backwards run, so he's still got eyes on the field of play. Um uh, or, or again, just ask the assistants to kind of meet him on the goal line so they can have that discussion there and also two sets of eyes looking up the field rather than... I'm not talking about coming to like the six-yard area or, the, or anything like that, but just in a little bit. Um, I also think just prior to this, though, he spends a lot of time with the injured player. Uh, I mm -hmm. think as soon as the physio is on, he could have moved himself over and started having that discussion then. Because uh, in the meantime, everyone is kind of allowed people that time to kind of form their own consensus of what, what is happening. Uh, and in that instance, if that is the case, the goalkeeper now thinks, well, a goal has been scored. They've all lined up. He's maybe wound up a little bit more to the point where he would consider, in this case, yeah, throwing a ball towards a referee. But if he was a little bit more pissed off, it could have been a lot more of an aggressive action towards the referee. Yeah, it could have been. Could have been. And if you think it was a goal... Why didn't he kick the back towards the centre circle? How many times you see that after the goals being scored? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's so that, that's the two the two. He's either resigned to the fact that he's conceded a goal and he punts it up the field back into the centre circle, or he's still pissed off, doesn't think it's goal, doesn't think it should be, and that's where he's directed it at the ref. All right then, Nate. Well, that's see, so that's 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 where I was going to come at now, and that's why I've rewinded it uh, to this to this point because I I in my opinion, uh, well, not in my opinion, but. If I was to make an educated guess, it would be to, to or to make some kind of guess would be to look at that. that that's why I've paused it at this moment because I'm I was wondering if uh, Adam had said something to the goalkeeper at this stage, hence the reason why he's given him the ball. And then and obviously again, basically in accordance with what Ant's just said, that he doesn't think that it's going to be a goal and he's not resigned to having conceded a goal because he's he's given the ball towards the goalkeeper because he doesn't know the restart of players what's happened but I do feel there's been some form of communication there whether it's to just say I'm going to go and talk to my assistant or whether it's that I'm going to you know do whatever or it's not going to be a goal whatever it might be I don't know but I do think that just the still that we've got on the image here now it, to me it's saying that there's been some form of communication between the referee and the goalkeeper Mm. Another thing I like to coach at any level is never lose the ball. As a referee, never lose the ball. Always know where the ball is. The ball's the hanging nades of the game. But you need to know what that ball is. This is a good example of it. You lose the ball. You, you, that ball, you could have done anything with that ball. He could have just gone here. Give us the ball. Give us the ball, keeps. He doesn't, does he? He's lot, he loses the ball. And the ball becomes from behind him. He could have tripped over that. Easily could have tripped over that. I made himself look a right knob there, couldn't he? <laughs> so I'd always advise never lose the ball, never take your back on the ball, never lose the ball. If you think about it, everything you talked about from the start position, you said about opening your body, so, and having a flight of the ball coming in. You're already talking about the ball. You know, It's a really good never, ever lose the ball. This is a, a quite a, a good example of it. It would be nice for, for Adam to go, just throw the ball over here for us, mate. We'll have it in a minute. Instead, mm. it looks like it's come after him. He hasn't managed that situation. So going back to what we said about managing the injuries, hasn't really managed it at all, has he really? Now he's got this with the ball, hasn't really managed that, has he? And he's going over to his line now. Do you say about him running backwards over to his assistant? Uh, yeah, potentially. Yeah, because he's only looking at his line now, isn't he? Yeah. Everyone else is behind him. He just had this contentious issue. There's a player on the ball, player being on the floor, he's wiping his nose there and his shot. They're not smacking him out. But well, surprised Nathan's not moaning about his undergarment there, but that's another point. <laughs> but like, you know, it could be quite a volatile situation, couldn't it? And all he's concerned of is looking at the one person who isn't going to cause him trouble, his own line out. Mm. So this is another thing about the Goldilocks zone. Yeah, it's good to go over there and talk to his line out. Great for the teamwork box. There's a better way of doing it. There's a much better way of doing it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know, man. Maybe I, I'm, yeah, okay, I'm going to say I think you're being a bit pedantic there, if I'm being totally honest, because I think that um, I think that you can trust a colleague who's facing in on the field of play. I don't. I think that yes, okay, it will be a great little bonus feature, but I think it's something a little bit more than is required. If I'm being totally honest, I think it's a little what, bit extra. What, what not putting your back to all the players? 
You well, yeah, because I think what I'm saying is if you're on your own, compl- well, if you're on your own, you wouldn't be going there. You'd be going consulting, would you? Yeah, but what I'm saying is, it, so, well, hang on a second. If you're on your own, moving in any direction, you've got to be more mindful of that. But I think that you can switch off on that a little bit, justifiably and acceptably, if you're working with an assistant who's looking in on the field of play. I mean, I know it's a totally different thing. And, I'm, and you know, you might say, oh, you're digressing it, you're pulling it in a direction it doesn't need to go into. But when uh, we've got VAR in a Premier League game now, right, and the referee goes, right, I'm just going to look at the monitor. One assistant takes responsibility for one half, another assistant takes responsibility for the other half of the pitch while that referee is looking at the monitor, while his uh, attention is of a different direction, okay? I think that it's just as justifiable to do that within a normal game where the referee might be dealing with a specific incident that the assistant referee should be alert to everything that's going on in their own half of the pitch. So you don't think it would be the Goldilocks zone to run backwards here? I think it would be a great bonus, but I don't think you can criticise them for not doing it. Well, you remember what the, what the presentation's called? Yeah. The Goldilocks zone. So... If you were ticking this an A, a B, and a C in regards to how you're managing your teamwork, there's, there's other ways you can do it. Some people might even call the line a one. Come to me a little bit. Come to me a little bit. Yeah. And some crowds, you they can hear everything you're managing, and they're mm-hmm. only a, a meter and a half away from you. Yeah. So sometimes you might call the line a one a little bit to go. Come on a bit. Then you haven't got that problem with the with the the sub to deal with. Yeah. And then you can manage it that way. So the Goldilocks zone would be all those in there. He would run backwards. He can come on, start running backwards. They would meet, and then they've got two pairs of eyes looking at everything. That's the Goldilocks zone. That's the thing we like. To, that's the good practice. Yeah. See what I mean? Overdoing this way gives gives an observer something to write about. That's the point, because he can use that ball getting flung into his... Well, yeah, it's not aggressive, it's, it's gentle, but it just gives them something to talk about. I just don't, I just don't think that... Uh, well, in my opinion, and of course I'm not an observer certainly not but in my opinion I think an observer would be foolish to even bring that up because looking back at the tape you can clearly see it's not an aggressive action in any way shape or form so I think to to even make that suggestion that it might have been an aggressive action is is a road you don't want to go down as an observer in my opinion but the point is the referee would never know whether it was or it wasn't. And that's what the observer would pick up on. Some of the twists on observers, and let them comment in here, will say to you, do you think he he threw that ball at you really aggressively? And Adam can't answer that, can he? Because he hasn't clocked it. Well, he could could say no. Yeah, yeah, but then he'd be guessing because his awareness levels were not there to monitor that situation. All he'd have to do is point out, throw the ball over there for us, mate, job done. No one says a word. All I'm saying is is that when we, we do these... These talks, it's like as you build your toolbox as you go through your refereeing career, all these little things just get dropped into your toolbox. You start using them more often, you realise they become more natural than think, oh God, I should have done that. It was in my toolbox. This is a good example of saying never lose the ball. Yeah, no, I can accept that. that that's, that's where this is going, mate. But good stuff. No, I, I appreciate you coming in like that. So play it, play it, mate, and let's see what goes over. He's not even looking, as he? Look? No. The other way. See what I mean? So as an assessor, that's that's a talking point. That's a talking point. And then we've got the situation where the subs hanging around, what we talked about yesterday, where, you know, he's there to listen, to try and influence. <laughs> Adam clocks it really, really well. Do one, mate. Which is really, really... That's the top end of the Goldilocks zone, isn't it? His that's, expression, like that substitute's expression when he's been told to go away is one of an absolutely crestfallen guy who <laughs> thought he was being dead clever. And then he's like, ah, I've been busted. And in fairness, look at Kev's posture. Well, exactly. I know. How top yeah. tall is that? That's what I'm saying. How top tall is that? Yeah. He I'm saying that about position. him looking into the pitch the whole time. The whole time, yeah. Yeah. Really, really good stuff by Kev. Really, really top tall stuff. So, so that part of it, when we're talking from Rob Zaver's point of view, there's some nice boxers getting ticked here, isn't it? In the team weight box. But to get the top end of the marks, the assessor would say, look, the development in this area is maybe should have run a little backwards, maybe call them on a little bit, 
get them away from the line out. Those little Goldilocks zones, those all 1% are all in there to be have. And we call them cherry pickers. Go and pick the cherries out. Go and get the cherries. And that's how you get these marks of 73s to 75 and a half, 76s, all these little extra 1% all over the field to play. And there's loads of them in here, isn't he? There's absolutely from the star position to the everything. There's absolutely loads in them, isn't it? Yeah. And what do you take on this? The next phase that we talked about. Does the sound come through on this? Oh, by the way, let me play it. But do, do you play it with sound? The reason being is that when he blows the whistle, as he walks out, as he comes away to the centre circle here, the crowd cheer for the goal, don't they? They do, yeah. I'll, and I will. I, what I'll do is I'll overlay the the clip. Uh, yeah. If we if we play it along now, because yeah. what what the ref's about to do is make a massive gesture, yeah, pointing towards the centre circle, which is ubiquitous, ubiquitously universal. Of I'm a referee and I'm awarding a goal. Blow the whistle and point. And it's the blow the whistle and point that's like, goal, brilliant, everything's fine. And then this is where the confusion happens. He's already tapping his pockets. He's already calling players back into the half. So he's not saying, stay there, we're going to kick off again. And if you pause it just there, Nath, as well. Yeah. We touched on this the other day. Yeah. That look at the referee surroundings here. So he's... Probably picked the three biggest players. <laughs> I don't think, the thing is, I don't think he's picked them. He's picked the one that he's going to caution, and he, he's been flanked by two big lads over there, hands on hips, going. It's it's typical like uh, bully boy behaviour, isn't it? Hands on hips, towering over, looking down. What are you going to do? Um, and in fairness, is the captain one of them? I don't know. I don't think so. No one's wearing an armband. That I can tell. The the the. The guy that uh, Adam's with directly in front of, he's the one that's getting cautioned, isn't he? Number seven, the goal scorer. Yeah. Getting cautioned for deliberate handball. Um, well, yesterday, yesterday, you said he was the one that elbowed. Yeah, no. I, uh, number 10 was the one that threw an elbow and I think should have been um, admonished for, for that style of play. sanctioned. Yeah, I, I, that's my thought on that. Uh, it shouldn't have even... Well, it would have got to the guy that handballed it anyway. But I think... On the grand scheme of things, I still think as the ball is floated in, number 10 has committed a foul on the defender. Um, however, we'll go with what, what the referee has seen and, and made his decision on. So he's caution, his caution technique now, we we discussed briefly the other day, where uh, he clearly didn't say, I'm about to caution you, here's a yellow card. Prior to this, what we're seeing right now, it, it should be a discussion, either one or one on one with a player that's getting cautioned in a neutral part of the ground. Now where he is, I think that's not quite neutral enough. Needs to be about five meters back into the half. He's just come from and only call in the player or for, for ease of communication and probably not to have an ally. But if you call the captain over as well, if you then have to take further action because of maybe a massive show of dissent or something like that, you've got the captain there with you. So you can kind of say, right, you you need to be on my side. Here's the decision. It's your job to kind of explain it to everyone else. When the manager asks you at the end of the game, before we even get there, you'll already know because you're the responsible one. But I'm booking this player for deliberately handballing it um, as, as the referee and the assistant saw in the clip. Uh, so what he has done is he's just pulled the, the player over that he's going to book, the number seven. Two of his mates have come over and he's put himself, and we always say the players are surrounding the referees, but in this instance, I think Adam has put himself into a situation to be surrounded. And I think player management-wise, he could have done a little bit better there. Yeah, I agree. Carry on playing it again here. To see if any other clues you get from communication between the match officials. See, that is the captain of the armband, see? Now, look what the captain does straight away. And Adam has to go in there and sort that out. Number 10 is the captain. Right. Now, interestingly, he goes to shout at the lino. He doesn't have a go with the ref, does he? Yeah. So what does that tell you? That it was the assistant's decision. Did Maybe Adam has said, I've consulted with my linesman and he has told me he's seen you deliberately handle the ball. 
that's probably the end of it because he then throws up the yellow. The, the, the lad that gets cautioned gets his hands on his head. He's like, I can't believe this. This is ridiculous. Not only have I not scored a goal, but I'm also being cautioned. Uh, and then the captain, yeah, like I said, ironically, <laughs> when I said, um, <laughs> maybe the captain's there so you can explain and he'll be the one that's reasonable and, and the, the kind of the ally in that situation. <laughs> but he's not. He's the one that's going, oh, fucking hell, linesman. Um, so, yeah. But then... Also, in that same instance, just as the yellow card went up, you've also had uh, about five of the opposing players come into that situation as well, thus outnumbering the players that are getting booked and then potentially making more of a confrontation. So that's also not ideal. Like if you take it just just back to that moment where the card goes up, you'll get a better freeze frame of, of that moment. So you've got, what is it, four players there? As the referee, you are now surrounded by three players from each team with your yellow card up in the air. I don't think that's anywhere near best practice <laughs> for for that no. situation. No, it's not. And, and it's, a, it's a good spot. And I think when you're in this scenario, he, he hasn't looked like he's trying to manage it at all. Um, it, but what was brilliant with Adam is that when he managed it with his non-verbal communication over by Kev to get rid of the sub, then this bit, as soon as he clocks the captain, mm. going to shoot round, he then stops him immediately, doesn't he? Hey, what, what are you doing? And he's yeah. with really positivity. This stuff here, look, he clocks you. So when you go, whoa, 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 yeah, get, yeah, 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 that's there. good. That strong body language, he actually moves back yeah. into his path. So the Goldilocks zone here it is top, top draw. That's then good. Then we got yeah. our culprit up there talking to his mate, going, oh, no, I didn't have <laughs> But like, when it's clearly he, he has. So look at the body language here. The only one that looks like it's going to go off is the captain, isn't it? They're all relaxed, sitting quite relaxed. But it is clear, and what would be interesting to see your point on this, Nate, it's clear that he said, me Lionel's had input on this. Mm. There's no other reason yeah. for that captain to, to lose his head and go as if he's going to comment and have a go, a go at the Lionel. No, I totally agree. But what, what I was... You know what I was thinking, um, as, as just as you were talking there, really was um, that I was thinking, ah, well, what I would be like, what I, what I would like to think that I would have done is, is would have had a good pre match conversation with the captains and you know, the usual conversations of how can we work together, I'm gonna need you to help me today, and all that kind of thing. And, and I think that that's part of the the conversation that, that I would have been reminding him of, um, you know, so would hope that he'd had that conversation prior to the kickoff, would hope that um, he could then use that to remind him and basically say, look, remember what we talked about here. I'm looking to you to support these decisions that, that I make and to help me manage this game today so that we can all have it pass off successfully. Well, it's interesting because the, the latter stage of this presentation is about... And if, if I read as a thing as thing as a blag, it's a not blag. Is the pre-match? We do con, we do conclude this by saying how much of what happens would have actually be covered in your pre-match as a team of three, which is there's quite a lot in me. There's have I got the right man? You 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 guys thought he booked the wrong fella, didn't you? A couple of days well, ago, like Martin. What I would say is we we were we we were looking at a different defence, okay? We were looking at a different defence. You were, yeah. So that's probably why we thought it was the wrong player. So, okay, then. So if you think it's the wrong player, as a lino, are you getting involved? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You don't, you, you don't, At the end of the day, you're there to help your mate. Yeah. You're not going to allow him to, to, to sort of drop a bollock, are you? No, absolutely not. There's, there's probably some out there that would. But, yeah, <laughs> but it's, nice, it's nice to know the majority of us wouldn't. But on the pre-match bit, there's some stuff we will cover in the pre-match, and he... Mass competition, there could be a bit of a conversation going on. If I'm incorrect in law, don't let me restart the game without being correct in law. You've got managing situations. If I want to wait here, yeah, call me over. You know, those little things are going to be covered in the pre-match there, aren't they? Obviously, if you're on your own, this is a bit of a nightmare scenario. When it with club linos, this is a bit of a nightmare scenario. It takes a brave man or woman to, to manage this situation. Yeah. So, at this point, you weren't sure... Even now, who who's being booked? Um, well, you know now it's the lads with his arms out at this to the other bloke. He's the one that's being booked. 
you're still not sure what what he's being booked for. Right? Not not for no. And that's you know? that's again part of the cautioning technique. I think we we talked about yesterday was in that moment where he's talking to the player, not not just giving the yellow card, not just putting that up, but also pointing to where the offence happened, indicating what the offence was for, and then producing the yellow card. Um, as if if we were baffled watching this clip, so is everybody in the stadium, but so are the two dugouts worth of managers, coaches and substitutes that will now be on your back for the next few minutes. Because what the fuck was that for, ref? Uh, that that sort of stuff's going to be coming out. And if they don't have a clear uh, kind of picture of what you're doing, they will see that as an opportunity to undermine any future decisions that you make uh, in the in in that sort of way, I think. What, I, what, I'm, what I'm happy to come in and support with as well, Ant, is... Um... And I, I don't know if you get it, but I, I get it quite a bit, to be fair. And, and it's to be honest, without being arrogant, it genuinely is normally when I've made a correct decision. Is you'll get that you'll get that feeling of where players are going to come up and say, "Oh, is that handball as well? And is that a is that a foul as well? And is that going to be a yellow card as well? And is that going to be a red card as well?" And it, to be honest, nine times out of ten, that happens when you get a decision bang on. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I know where you're coming from there. Yeah. Yeah, they're only going to view the decision from where they are, not where you are. And that's something we've always got to remember. It's a good management tool in the toolbox again to say, look, it might be right from where you were, but from where I was, it was a bang on yellow. Can we just yeah. leave it? Yeah. So you, you, And then you can say, look, I've told you twice, I'm not going to go anymore. So there's a way of managing those situations yeah. but when, when that happens. So if you just ignore it, it's like a boiling pot of water. It just ends up boiling over. You got yeah. to be able to turn the gas down a little bit. I and, agree with that one. You got to you got to nip that sort of. Yeah. I wouldn't call it dissent. I'd call it kind of a petulant kind it of. It will be though, and it will exactly. be exactly. So before it gets to dissent, you say, "Listen, I've given the decision. Just crack on with it now, mate. No, no one's mm. going to change it. Uh, but you need to stop." And, and the problem is, again, you're then taking a huge risk. Again, we talk about the role of an observer here. You're then taking a huge risk if you don't manage that dissent properly and it turns into foul and abusive language, mm. which we've talked about before. You know, we talked about it with Jörg, um, off in a bus, all those things, looking at that, and then you get an observer who then turns to you and says, oh, you know, you've had that problem and that problem with this communication, and he was saying that to you, and you end up in a big, big situation where you've been called all the names under the sun and you haven't been seen to deal with it correctly and it can end up wrecking you, you know, wrecking your, your evaluation. But the good, the I, good. It, it, it's, it's mindful. Sorry, so I think this is important to talk about this bit. It's mindful not to get hung up on assessors. I know we talk about it a lot because yeah. this is the, this is the, the thing we're trying to do. Try to get your good marks, try to be a better referee. Mm-hmm. More important in here to be mindful of what can go wrong. Rather yeah. than what an assessor picks it up from. We only yeah. mentioned the assessor, observer, but I'm going to say assessor. The only reason we're minding the assessor is to condition you, condition because mm. there's going to be times when you're going to need, you know, mm-hmm. that's the reason we want to do it properly. We want to do it properly whether there's an assessor there or not. We want to be consistent in how we referee, how we address tackles, how we address descents, how we address teamwork. It's going to always be the same whether there's an observer there or not. You've even got to look at a snapshot that we talked about yesterday. If you snapshot this photo of Adam, pointing at that captain, that don't look good. That's not a good visual look, is it? Mm. But when we're looking at it, now I've just praised Adam for how he's done. Where are you going? Stay there. A point is never, ever a good thing for us to do. It's always a better with a, with the palm of the hand. Sometimes that's more assertive for the podcast guys on turning my hands vertically. That's more assertive to go, hey, I'm having no more. Having a horizontal palm is a very much softer approach. So you don't need to point, taking those four fingers away in the thumb turns that into a very different gesture, doesn't it? So if you are, if you do want to point at someone, just try to do it with all yeah. your hands together, with a vertical palm rather than a horizontal palm. Just a simple twist of that non-verbal communication changes the game in regards to perception. So that's just the thing I wanted to look at the other guy behind, exactly the opposite. His arms are out like this, very passive. He's probably using every every swear word. Under yes. the sun to that player, saying, I'm just at this effing goal, blah, blah, blah. 
But Adam looks like he's the more aggressive one, isn't he? Yeah, well, that's it. If you if you now if you pull thing. everyone's body language apart here, you've got the two yellows yeah. in the centre, both with their hands on their hips. The one in the yeah. top left who's just out for a casual stroll. The the yeah. the one just uh, the next left, his his head is down, he's walking away. The captain that's just mm. been uh, there's so much you could take from the body language, but you'd have to say, yeah, if if you were to pick out the most aggressive person in this picture, who would it be? It's the ref. It's the referee. Yeah. It's an important learning point of this clip that way, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to dwell on it a bit. And because non-verbal communication, gestures and image, visual impact, as you climb the ladder, you probably ask more people talk about your visual impact of how you are. Really, really helps or harms how you get messages out to everybody. Like, luckily, facing away from the technical areas here, we don't know what else Adams has done. But well, for the handball gesture of just tapping his hands to say that was handball would have sold it to everybody, wouldn't it? Yeah. Even before he got to the place, as he's walking up, he could have just goes, lads, it's handball, come here. All done, job done, handball, yeah. come here. And, and then isolate him and or do whatever way you want to do it. Yeah. Control where you want to manage those people. But I just think it's important for, for people to look at it at all levels of football. I know we get het up. I criticise the RAL off for just concentrating on you know, Premier League and Football League appointments and all the pictures always seem to be Premier League and people like that on the social media. I think it's important that we concentrate on this level of the football and below to see the answers and little questions and helpful hints we can get from this sort of level of football. And body language, non-verbal communication and visual impact is a big learning point in this snapshot. Absolutely. You got any input on that, Nate? Nate? Mental, mental... Size and mental resilience, or yeah, you know, your facial expressions is all, all yeah, sub a little bit of a tilt of a head on the top left there. Yeah, what's going on here? Isn't he? And I, I think that you know, to be honest, that tilt of the head could be incredibly aggressive. Um, it could be, it's something you need to watch out for. It is, um, it, yeah. and, I, and I think that. I think that it's like, like you've said, you know, and I, to be honest, I think that what I'm saying is probably standard practice amongst you know, FA people and things like that as well, who are coaches and people like that. But I genuinely do think there's an awful, awful lot to be said for the way that you, like we've said there, the way that you are taking it to a completely different situation. Um, if, for example, a tight one where it's going over the byline, bang on the whistle, bang the arm out to say, this is a corner ball, I'm giving that... The, the the whistle drowns out the noise of their shouts. The signal's really clear. They all turn, they all look at you. You're looking right in that corner. You're giving a really clear uh, corner kick. And I think that things like that can help massively. You know, um, I'll just rewind this a touch. I don't know if he goes for his whistle here when he when he actually tries to speak to the 10. Oh, when you go back there, you see his palm. Yeah, he doesn't. His palm is vertical only before he goes as well. Yeah. To be honest, Martin, yes, he gets probably the finger position wrong there. But otherwise, he's because I was thinking about it as you were talking about that there. And I think he gets it absolutely bang on in terms of, as you can see for the camera now, I'm doing this. Yeah. Where the way it's not an aggressive point. He has coming round, and that's what I was thinking as well. I'd be saying, I'd be I'd be coming round with me arm. I wouldn't be going like in a straight line. I'd be I'd be coming round in a just get out of it type action because. I think that it's the right thing to do, not to try and stand and point at people for as long as you possibly can. Yeah. The, the, I was going to say there, just for the purpose of the people that will be listening to this without seeing it, um, a pokey pointy finger, one that is thrust away from the body, is a lot more aggressive than a sweepy pointy finger. And in this instance in the video, Adam the referee is doing a sweeping finger that's pointing back kind of towards the player's half to kind of control that aggression. I think an open palm would have been best practice if I'm being yeah. totally honest, Dan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gold your locks on. Gold your locks. Point, point works. It's assertive yeah. rather than aggressive. But a palm is a bit more... Is a bit, bit more too more hot. For, it's a bit too hot, Martin, I think, the, yeah. the, the, the point. And the even, is, yeah, yeah. Even with the palm, instead, if you need to direct, fine, yeah, it, it's something that's very assertive. But like this, in this instance, if he just had his palm out instead of his finger out and he'd swept the player back towards and said, no, back you go, go on. That is, again, 
a, a, a lot calmer way to deal with, with, yeah, than, than the, the, the finger. So it's interesting, isn't it? Like we got to this point here where we still don't know what's going on. We still haven't got the money shot of what is being yellow, yellow carded for, which we'll talk in, in the next episode. However, if you can wrap up this one saying, at the learning points we've come along just on this last, say, six or seven, eight minutes, look what we've learned about stuff that isn't in the book, stuff that you don't learn on your basic referees course, about all the signals you can read as a match official to help you aid and control a game, you know, verbal communication, reading other people's communication. You know, the, the guy who's being booked is still going on a little bit there, isn't he? He becomes a little bit more of your target than the lad who's behind him with his hands behind his back. It's those little learnings from these sorts of scenarios that are just as important as good positioning, getting the decision right. And there's a lot in here, and I'm just glad that we froze it that way. So what we'll do, we wrap up on this one. I hope you had something out of it. We had some really good input. I'm really pleased with how you two have, have dealt with this. I'm going to put you on the spot and taking the, taking the mick out of you a bit, Nate, over, over mm. your there. Uh, over your tape and surprise you tape under garments. I'm, I'm surprised you haven't mentioned the white tape on those black socks, but forget about that bit. <laughs> but like there's lots and lots of stuff that when you start looking at it and you talk to people, this is why we think it's crucial what Kerry Travers is doing in regards to their mentoring. We had it on one of our shows not so long ago. Mm-hmm. These this is mentoring. This this is coaching at distance, which can be done everywhere. You don't necessarily have to go to a game. It's very important to go to a game and coach a massive issues. But these sorts of learnings is where we want to be as a charity, all free as part of our centre of refereeing education. So listen, let's go into the next points. We'll see you on the next blog. Like, share, comment, and we'll see you on the next piece. Of Goldilocks down! <laughs> Not doing it? Not doing it, Mark? No? All right, we'll no. just end. <laughs> <laughs>